So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, welcome to Cambushan. Um, and I say good morning, afternoon, and evening because we're being joined from our cousins in the United States and from Europe uh, and also from Japan. So for those of you in Japan, don't feel as though you have to stay up long past your bedtime. You're welcome to um, leave early if you wish. And if anyone else starts to feel sleepy, then that's also understandable. But uh, what I hope to do today is to go through just a few of the applications for the fast response gas analyzers. And that includes some RDE measurement um, uh, data that were taken fairly recently. And I'd encourage you, if you'd like to, to submit uh, any questions as we go along. And I'll try to monitor these. And uh, if I catch them out of the corner of my eye, I'll try to answer them there and then. Um, but um, if not, I'll catch up on them right at the end of the broadcast. So I suspect that this will take about 25, 30 minutes. Um, but um, I'm hoping that now you can see my screen. And there are a lot of embedded videos in here as well. And I'm hoping that we have sufficient bandwidth uh, in our respective countries and companies and homes to be able to run them nice and smoothly. But let's, let's see how we get on. So for those of you who um, don't know much about Cambushan, um, we've been, we're a spin-off from the University of Cambridge Engineering Department back in 1987, and we have two divisions. Uh, one division looks after emissions calibration, calibration of after-treatment systems. We do an awful lot of cold start catalyst heating strategy, SCR, um, ammonia dosing calibration, a lot of DPF and GPF calibration work. So we have uh, eight transient engine dynos and a chassis dyno, and we're putting in plant now for um, the development and the testing of electric vehicles, um, but especially hybrid vehicles, which have some nice stop-start uh, transient characteristics to study. But uh, what I'm talking about primarily today is um, equipment and data coming from the products division. So um, we develop and manufacture specialist um, fast response analyzers for both gases and particulates. And we also have a system for measuring, for, for evaluating um, particulate filters. Um, so Really, the, the focus for today will be the gas analyzers, uh, the fast gas analyzers, and in future webinars, which I'll mention right at the end of the presentation, we'll look at um, the particle filter test system and the particle instruments. But just to whet your appetite slightly in terms of the particle instrument, I just want to show you a little bit of data taken from a uh, GDI uh, engine. Um, running on the new European drive cycle. So the NEDC, where we start the engine, we idle for 11 seconds and then engage first gear and pull away. And I want to show you the particle spectra, the particle um, size, if you can see my mouse pointer there, size along the x-axis and particle number concentration up the y-axis. And what we're going to do is to drive this in real time. Here we go. So there's the engine starting. And there you can see the particle size and number um, of that cold start. But as we get to 11 seconds and we engage first gear and pull away, you'll see quite a large um, spike of accumulation mode particles as you know, wet fuel hits cold surfaces and burns with a rather sooty yellow flame. And then also along the bottom here, when you can see the snake moving, in the green are the unburned hydrocarbons measured with a fast FID. And you can see little blips coming through in nucleation mode down at 10, 15 nanometers um, with each of those um, little bits of ragged combustion. So anyway, more of that in a future um, webinar. But to concentrate on the gas analyzers, so we produce fast analyzers for hydrocarbons, NOx, CO, and CO2, and their response times uh, are about one millisecond, the T 10 to 90 response time, about one millisecond for total hydrocarbons, about two milliseconds for our chemiluminescence analyzer for NOx, and about eight milliseconds for CO and CO2. So it's primarily designed for looking at very, very transient emissions and combustion phenomena. So for example, if we take a four-stroke engine at 2000 RPM, 
the duration of an exhaust stroke is about 15 milliseconds. So with a one millisecond device, for example, fast hydrocarbons, we should be able to see what is happening within a single exhaust stroke. And I'll show you a little bit of data from that later. Um, but we can also adapt the equipment for measuring directly in cylinder. So that's through uh, an offset spark plug. We can measure the hydrocarbons directly from the, the combustion chamber. So these uh, work by taking the industry standard method of measuring uh, the various gaseous components. So bottom left there, we have a flame ionization detector, just as you'd have it in conventional analyzer, but we've miniaturized it. And if I go back a slide and show you on the right-hand side, a, a, a cabinet, there's a vacuum pump in the bottom of that cabinet on the right hand side, but you can see two sample heads and these are attached down 30 foot, 10 meter cables to that cabinet. But it's within those sample heads that the detectors are housed and they operate at low pressure. So that the gas is sucked through a heated um, sample probe and into the sample head at about sonic velocities. So there's very, very fast transit of gas and also associated with that very little mixing of the gas as it's traveling through those capillaries. So that can result in a, a very, very fast time response. So bottom left, we have fast FID. In the top, we have fast NDIR, where the gas is brought through a heated sample probe. It then enters the chamber. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. It enters the chamber, splits in two directions through this sample chamber, which is at low pressure, but there is infrared light shining down from the emitter through a sapphire window, through our sample of gas, and then beneath the lower sapphire window, there is an optical um, filtered chopping disc um, which rotates above an infrared detector. And the wavelength of the filters in this disc correspond to CO, CO2, and a, a reference filter um, with a wavelength of no constituent in exhaust. And by um, the signal processing of the data which is being sporadic, uh, um, um, received on this detector, we can get um, real time or within eight milliseconds measures of CO and CO2. Bottom right is our fast chemiluminescence uh, detector. Um, so this is like a conventional chemiluminescence detector. This takes our um, NO uh, sample. Uh, it mixes it with ozone from an ozone generator in, in that cabinet. Um, and when those two react together, they produce light. And the light is detected on a photomultiplier um, back in the cabinet. But the light is conducted down a fiber optic bundle from the sample head down 30 feet um, into the detect into the photomultiplier. And so you have a response time of this instrument of about two milliseconds. So by way of data, here is some data taken from a port fuel injected gasoline engine, which is, this, this data is now fairly old, but it's a nice illustration of um, the transient uh, response of um, uh, the characteristics of an engine when it's starting on the FTP drive cycle. And we're measuring before and after an underbody three-way catalyst. So we're looking at two minutes here, and the catalyst has, has not really started to do anything apart from when you get to about 100 seconds. The blue tailpipe and the red engine out start to diverge at around, um, at around 100 seconds. So that's when the catalyst is lighting off for hydrocarbons. But but along the way, you can see lots of spikes happening. So for example, here at about 28 seconds, there's a spike associated with, uh, in gray, this little acceleration on the FTP cycle. There's another deceleration followed by uh, a, a slight acceleration at about 40 seconds, and you can see a spike here. Now, the other thing that we have taken is the, uh, the output from a conventional gas analyzer in green, also measuring the engine out gas. So uh, really the green and the red are measuring at exactly the same point, but with very different response times. So you can see that there's, there's no question that the green is not accurate. It's just that given it has a response time, uh, which is about a thousand times slower than the fast FID, it can't resolve uh, those spikes and when they occur and correlate them accurately with whatever engine parameter is provoking that spike of emissions. 
You can also see if you look very closely, I've blown up a little bit here at about five seconds. So the engine out data looks as though it's got a load of noise on it, uh, whereas the tailpipe is relatively smooth. Now that's just because the um, the, the individual um, four-cylinder engine, um, the individual hydrocarbon emissions from each of the cylinders is slightly different. So you can effectively see individual cylinder events coming through on the, uh, the combined engine out hydrocarbon data. Uh, and the cold start itself, uh, the peak that we're reading there from the fast FID on the engine out is about 18,000 parts per million C3, whereas the peak that we measure with the conventional analyzer is about three and a half thousand. Um, so this just allows you to have a little bit more insight into how high those spikes are of the engine out and of the tailpipe, and also what they correlate with, exactly when they happen. So if we zoom in to the first 10 seconds, uh, of exactly the same data. So we've logged this data at about a kilohertz, given that we have a, a, a one millisecond response time. Uh, and what you can see there in the cold start, the engine out is two spikes. And effectively, because the catalyst is stone cold and is not giving you any uh, conversion efficiency there, the quality of the combustion at the cold start will translate directly into the tailpipe emissions. So given that one has authority now over, with GDI engines, the precise amount of fuel which is injected into the cylinder, and also you have some control over the air path, the variable valve timing, the spark timing, especially for spark retard for catalyst heating strategies, then um, this may be useful in terms of um, optimizing the combustion to minimize the amount of um, poor combustion that may occur during an engine start. And the equipment could be configured to be able to uh, run uh, and sample at um, very, very low temperatures, so way below minus 20 C. Um, some customers have run it down at minus 40 Fahrenheit, which I think is equivalent to minus 40 C. Um, you will also notice that there is an apparent delay from the engine out to the tailpipe. So the tailpipe, although it broadly follows the same path, the same shape, it is somewhat uh, attenuated um, and it is delayed. Now there is a delay because of the, the, the time taken for the exhaust gas to pass through the catalyst, uh, but there is also the fact that uh, a catalyst when it's cold uh, and if there are any liquid um, fuel around that will land on the catalyst surface and then fairly slowly it will boil off and reappear in the um, in the tailpipe. So if we took a snapshot at two seconds for example you'd be thinking well there's something wrong here because our tailpipe data seems to be we seem to be creating hydrocarbons because the engine out data is actually at 2000 ppm, the tailpipe data is at 4000, but it really is just because of the hang up effect on the catalyst. So all of these very, very transient effects become visible when one looks on uh, very fast timescales. Now, a nice little trick uh, with using the entire, the full bandwidth of the equipment. So if we put our sample probe behind the exhaust valve of just one of the cylinders of this engine, and we measured what was coming out during a single exhaust stroke as the engine is starting, this is again from a port fuel injected uh, gasoline engine at cold start. If I run this animation, which is real data, um, although uh, following the, the, the path of this animation above, we've got cylinder pressure in green and we've got unburned hydrocarbons in, in red. Now you'll notice that um, we're looking here at individual uh, exhaust events. You can see that we've had a motoring stroke, which is just about to scroll off the left-hand side of the screen there, but we've had a firing stroke, so nice high cylinder pressure, followed by a hydrocarbon um, level starting at about 15,000 parts per million propane, and um, during the main part of the exhaust expulsion event, that was about 10,000 ppm propane. But we're able to pick out from this data the fact that the hydrocarbons started to rise at our sample point before the exhaust valve will have opened. And that betrays 
a slight amount of exhaust valve leakage. And there was a very good SAE paper written by John Horde at Ford in the US in the mid-1990s, where they published some data from an engine which was sporadically exhibiting uh, exhaust valve leakage. So not every event leaked, but more than were supposed to were leaking. So sporadically, he was getting exhaust valve leakage events. And by putting the the, the um, sample probe of the fast FID close behind the exhaust valve um, of uh, one of his cylinders, he was able to um, monitor uh, the frequency with which these um, exhaust valve leakage events were occurring. So if I keep scrolling through the data, you can see a number of firing cycles and the same kind of signature of hydrocarbons after each exhaust event uh, comes out is, is fairly regular. But then we get a couple of misfires. So misfires, um, misfires are good because you can see you have a very low peak pressure there in green. And as soon as the exhaust valve opens, the hydrocarbons hit the roof. So we're up at about 38,000 for the first misfire. For the very next misfire, we've purged some of the residual burned gas out from the first misfire so that the second misfire appears to have more hydrocarbons in it, but that's mainly because we've purged out some of the residual gas, which was diluting the unburned hydrocarbon concentration. Then the engine continues, sometimes firing, sometimes not firing. Um, so this was an engine that was underdeveloped. It's under development. It was a fairly uh, rough calibration, but eventually it settles down. Oh no, there's one more misfire there. But you can see basically what's happening. We're seeing what's happening on a cycle by cycle basis, and we're even seeing what's happening within a single exhaust stroke. Now, if we look at the anatomy of one of those firing cycle hydrocarbon signatures measured in just one of the exhaust ports, the form of that signature tends to follow um, this sort of shape. So the exhaust valve opens and there's actually a, a little kind of rich pocket of hydrocarbons, which is the first gas to escape from the cylinder as the exhaust valve cracks open, uh, some of the hydrocarbons which are left unburned around the seat of the valve are the first hydrocarbons to be expelled from the cylinder and pass over the tip of the exhaust probe, uh, the, the, the fast fit sample probe. Later on in the exhaust stroke, we've got most of the burned gas coming out. So that's, that's, that's the bulk gas, the main sort of pumping stroke, the exhaust stroke. This first part uh, is, the, is the blowdown period, basically before bottom dead center. But then as the piston rises back up the, the, the combustion chamber, it scrapes off the hydrocarbons that have been laid down the wall of the cylinder, which have escaped combustion by hiding in the top land crevice and they are deposited down the walls of the cylinder and are scraped and scrolled off the cylinder and are the last gases to be ejected from the cylinder at the end of the exhaust stroke. So that's why at the end of the exhaust stroke, just before the exhaust valve closes, there is a rise in hydrocarbon uh, concentration and then the valve closes and the gas is just sitting there with nowhere to go. And so it sits there at a fairly high level, but it's not moving. So it's not contributing to the exhaust um, flow rate, that not the, 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 the mass flux of hydrocarbons leaving because there's no exhaust flow at this point. So it just waits for the next firing cycle. So if you took an arithmetic average of this data, it would actually show you something which was um, uncharacteristically dirty because you can remember that you, you, you might um, understand that most of the mass flow is occurring during the exhaust stroke when the gases are burned and the hydrocarbon concentration is, is somewhat lower. But um, a fast FID um, is often used for establishing the limits of spark retard for catalyst heating strategies. So by putting in a late spark, you can um, give up on some power, but you can make sure that the exhaust temperature um, during each combustion event or at the end of a combustion event uh, is still quite high when the exhaust valve opens. And um, this is betrayed by this cylinder pressure uh, trace. You can see that there's still burning going on even at the time of exhaust valve opening. Now, this tends to affect the hydrocarbon signature uh, because 
when a flame passes through um, gas containing hydrocarbons, the hydrocarbons are basically all burned. They may be, uh, they may be converted to um, CO um, or, or other um, uh, combustion products, but it's very, it's very difficult for any hydrocarbons to remain if they are in the gas phase and a flame front has passed over them. So instead of that signature that I showed you before, where the, the, the minimum there is about 500 ppm in that situation, you'll notice that when there is a late burn, the hydrocarbon concentration is virtually zero during the main part of the exhaust stroke. Uh, and this is happening because the ignition is so late that flames are basically shooting out into the exhaust port over the tip of the uh, fast fit sample probe. And therefore, they're reading basically zero hydrocarbons. Now, part of the, the Bosch calibration handbook used to advocate the use of a combustion fast FID to establish how late, how retarded you could place the spark, because a good indicator of your limit is the fact that the combustion begins to get ragged and begins to show up sporadic spikes of hydrocarbon from ragged combustion before that is apparent with um, cylinder pressure. So um, that's one of the applications and one of the main applications that the fast FID is, uh, is sold for. Now I've got here a lovely video which I'd like to share with you and I'm hoping that it will run smoothly. This was some data taken at the University of Loughborough um, uh, but on a JLR GDI engine and it's some um, uh, data looking across the combustion chamber, top of this um, combustion chamber, you can see the spark plug electrodes, um, but the, the yellow um, uh, flames, you'll see them whipping up to the top right, that is the flames from the direct injection engine exiting the exhaust valve and still burning as they enter the exhaust port. So, um, you can also detect the fact that there are flames in the exhaust by having a very, very um, narrow and fast response uh, thermocouple uh, positioned in the exhaust as well. But this, in conjunction with the fast FID, we were able to see the fact that from the, the, the video recordings, the camera, the high-speed camera, flames were entering the exhaust port and the fact that the hydrocarbons were burning down to almost zero was also uh, an indication of that. Now, I mentioned previously, it is possible to sample directly in the combustion chamber. And to do this, we use um, an offset sampling spark plug. So this is the type of spark plug which is often used to mount uh, pressure transducers. But we get them before they have been machined to accommodate a pressure transducer. And we fit them with an M3 um, uh, tapped hole such that we can put our heated sample capillary directly through the spark plug body and take our sample from just a few millimeters away from the plug electrodes. And then in terms of hydrocarbons, we get uh, during the compression stroke and just before ignition, we can find out what the hydrocarbon concentration is just before the time of ignition when the flame burns that concentration down to burned gas levels. And that concentration just before the flame is indicative of the air fuel mixture that you've managed to deliver to your plug electrodes, but it is also diluted by the uh, residual gas from the previous burning cycle. And therefore, by skip firing the engine or purging out the residual gas, um, you can get the air fuel ratio when there is uh, no residual gas current, if, that's, uh, if that is of any interest. Okay, so now we'll move on to some uh, NOx data. And this is also some data taken in the exhaust port of um, a gasoline engine, uh, port fuel injected gasoline engine, which is running at steady uh, speed, but all we've done here is suddenly given it a load transient. So we've opened the throttle basically. So you can see the cylinder pressure there in blue and the cycle by cycle um, NOx emissions occurring with each cycle. But at about 250 seconds, we whack the throttle open. There's a sudden increase in load, which therefore increases the amount of NOx that's reduced in the combustion, cycle, um, combustion chamber. And immediately you can see uh, that change in NOx. So for looking at transient uh, NOx emissions, we would use this method of fast CLD. If we were to put a fast CLD, two channels, one measuring the engine out, and one in the tailpipe, engine out in red, tailpipe in blue, 
And this is something that we often see uh, across a three-way catalyst where the closed loop fueling control is oscillating the engine slightly rich, slightly lean, and on an aged or an undersized catalyst, we can see sporadic breakthrough into the tailpipe on the lean half cycle. So if there's um, sort of depleted oxygen storage capacity with the three-way catalyst, you can see that um, you get very short duration. So each of the duration of these blue spikes is, uh, let's say, half a second or maybe a quarter of a second duration. If you were to look at that with a conventional analyzer, you would see a generally raised background level. But the fact that you can correlate this with the oscillations in lambda is, um, is a fairly good indicator of the, uh, the catalyst's uh, shortcomings. Now, I showed you before the fast NDIR system, and if we were to leap into a very advanced uh, application, which is, again, in cylinder sampling, if we put our fast NDIR and we only looked at the CO2, we can get a measure of the CO2 trapped in the residual gas, um, and this is at the end of the compression stroke and just before the flame produces CO2. So, for example, if you can see my mouse pointer at about 0 0.06 seconds on this graph, you can see a rapid rise in CO2 caused by the flame producing CO2 as it passes over the tip of the sample probe right beside the plug electrodes. But just before that point, we have a measure of each and every cycle's CO2, which is a measure of the residual gas trapped from the previous burning cycle. Uh, and this is quite uh, useful to see in terms of rapid um, variable valve timing control, or if a cylinder has been deactivated and then is reactivated, then the, 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 the rapid changes in residual gas content is fairly important to uh, the suppression of NOx. Another application that we've done in terms of fast CO2 is to look at uh, EGR and especially transient EGR. Now, what we did here was to use a um, fairly old, I think this is a Euro 3 diesel passenger car, uh, light duty diesel car. We peppered it with a number of sample points in its intake manifold. But we also had an access point for looking at the, um, the exhaust NOx from cylinder number one. Uh, and we also measured the CO2 just after the EGR valve, which is at the far side of the engine, so the exhaust size of the engine. But what we wanted to look at was the delay and the effects of the delay of the control of the EGR valve for the EGR being delivered round this pipe and then entering the intake manifold and then being distributed down the four intake port runners. So what we measured on the slide I'm about to show you is the CO2 which is present measured at the EGR valve. So that is the EGR being delivered from the valve and how long it takes for that EGR to actually be delivered into cylinder number one by measuring it right at the intake port uh, of cylinder number one. So um, if we look at the data, um, I'm sorry, I don't know what's happening here. Let me just uh, try and get my slideshow back in. There we go. Um, the pink trace at the top is the drive pressure, which is actually actuating the, uh, the EGR valve. So we know that during this part of the NEDC, the, um, there is a gear change and the EGR valve closes and then opens at about 123 seconds. We can see in the pink that the drive is closing and then opening the valve. And in red, the CO2 that we're measuring at the valve, we can see the action of that valve closing and opening. But the blue trace is the CO2 which we are measuring at the intake port of cylinder number one. And you can see to begin with that there is a delay in the EGR being delivered by about a second, but also when it is being delivered, you can see it building up slowly and you can see each and every of these little steps, that is a single intake stroke. So every 720 crank angle degrees, we get a new level of CO2 being introduced. So we know that there is a significant delay 
through the EGR pipe, significant by significant, I mean one second, but um, the, the, the data at exactly this point shows a big spike in NOx, which if there were some way of speeding up that EGR delivery, um, might be tackled or might be suppressed by the more rapid delivery of uh, a larger amount of EGR. Uh, now, one of the last applications I've got to show you in terms of combustion from CO and CO2 is that one can process the data that uh, that you've taken of CO and CO2, and assuming complete combustion, um, you can um, post-process the data and calculate the lambda, the air fuel ratio, from which that CO and CO2 must have been produced. Now, given that we have a response time of about eight milliseconds for the measurement of CO and CO2, then effectively you have uh, created yourself a very fast lambda sensor. So if we use um, this function and we have a macro that we supply with the fast CO, CO2 analyzer, which will allow you to um, perform these functions, you just need to put in the HCO ratio of the fuel uh, and perhaps some other parameters. Um, but um, if I show you the data in red, this is just from the fast FID. So this is hydrocarbons. And again, this is from a cold start port fuel injected gasoline engine, um, which is, I think this one is Euro three. So it does do a little bit of um, the, the, the calibration, the fuel delivery is quite difficult to get right on a PFI engine. But you can see that the, in gray, we have uh, cylinder pressure. Uh, and we can see the first two um, cycles are firing cycles. The uh, hydrocarbons emitted from them are relatively uh, low. But if we look at the CO and the CO2, the CO2 in dark blue shows uh, lots of CO2, about 12%, and very little CO for the first cycle. But the very next burning cycle shows about 8% of CO uh, and a reduction in CO2. Now, if we um, calculate from what lambda uh, these two events um, have been generated, we have the first one, uh, a lambda of about 1.3, so very lean, and the second firing stroke, very rich, a lambda of about 0.65. Um, now, um, this can be understood by virtue of the fact that uh, with a PFI engine, there's lots of liquid fuel lying around, especially at cold start. But a single combustion event, even though it's very lean, will suddenly evap evaporate and liberate a lot of fuel such that it's very hard not for the second firing cycle to be overfueled because it's had um, delivered to it such a large amount of fuel vapor, uh, vaporized by the preceding cycle. So we often see with PFI engines these violent swings, very wild swings in lambda from very lean to very rich. Okay, so um, uh, in current times, there's a lot of focus on real world driving emissions. And the great thing uh, from Cambodian's point of view about real world driving emissions is that the real world is full of transients. So we're well placed uh, to be able to help and measure um, transient emissions. If only we could miniaturize our equipment and put it on board uh, vehicles which we've spent a while doing. And one of the main uh, pollutants, which is of interest to both gasoline and diesel um, um, engineers is NOx. So we've taken the, the main control unit out of the cabinet and we are now powering it from a couple of accessory boxes which contain uh, the vacuum pumps, the ozone generator, some of the ancillaries, which would otherwise be contained in, in that rather large cabinet. But the system can be switched from this um, RDE configuration um, back into the laboratory uh, configuration so that the calibration work, which requires stable uh, background conditions can occur in the lab, uh, possibly rerunning parts of the drive that have been recorded in the real world. So I'm going to show you, um, although uh, you can collect data uh, from these same accessory boxes for hydrocarbons and for CO, CO2, most of the work that we've done on board has been to do with uh, fast NOx. 
And some of the most uh, troubling transients for most of the vehicles that we've tested uh, are all present within a simple speed bump. Because if we consider the transients that occur traveling from right to left in this picture, there may be some decel fuel shut off, so combustion stops. Then in a manual vehicle, uh, you would put in the clutch, the engine would restart, but just at idle, so under low load and low speed. But then in sector three, you might accelerate away from the speed bump, and then in, in section four, that may be a gear change, again, as you accelerate away from the speed bump. So what I'm going to show you now is a movie which will um, show the tailpipe NO from a Euro 4 gasoline engine uh, traversing a speed bump. So blue is what you need to look at. This is the instantaneous NO. We're logging the vehicle's uh, lambda uh, in green and tailpipe HEGO in pink. But you see that very short duration, quarter of a second spike of knocks. We're going to have to, sh I'll show this again at half speed because there's a lot going on in a very short space of time. So here we are approaching our speed bump. Combustion is occurring, very, very little knocks coming out the tailpipe. We go into decel fuel shut off, so our lambda goes um, sky high. But then the clutch goes back in. We return some combustion, but at low uh, load, just to idle, that's the start of combustion at 208 seconds. But the spike at 209 is our acceler away, acceleration away from the speed bump. And then the next one is the, 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 the gear change. So as you can see, three-way catalysts do a really very good job of um, taking out uh, tailpipe uh, knocks, except when there's a, a severe perturbation caused by transients, which can occur in the real world. Now, we did a little bit of testing with our friends at Marla Powertrain in Northampton, who own some PEMS equipment. And we, uh, on, on the same test, we looked at the restart NOx spike in the tailpipe from a one liter gasoline GDI engine. Uh, and that's shown in blue at 1019 seconds. And we compared that with PEMS equipment, which was bolted also on the tailpipe of the vehicle. So effectively, the blue and the yellow is exactly the same gas all you're seeing there is the difference between the response times of standard PEMS equipment, so perfectly uh, accurate, uh, and um, this is the, the, the equipment which is used for legislative uh, measurement, um, but you can see how it is smeared and difficult, therefore, to align any spikes that occur because they are um, smoothed out over the response time of the instrument. Now, if we combine the fast analyzers with the, uh, an accurate GPS um, system, we can pinpoint exactly where on a drive cycle or on a route that the main NOx events have occurred. Now, this is the Transport for London West London route, and we're zooming in here to a residential area. We're traveling from left to right, and this is some data taken from a Toyota Prius, which has just been over the um, speed bump, uh, which you can see on the left-hand side of the aerial photo. And then as the engine restarts and pulls away under load, there is a significant spike of NOx, which is produced as the engine restarts. Um, now, you may be forgiven to think that I've got something about, against speed bumps, but they are pretty problematic for, for vehicles to, to negotiate. And there's a beautiful correlation between spikes of NOx and the position of speed bumps. And it just so happens there are a fair number of speed bumps on their route. Generally, the route begins in North London. It's 55 kilometers long. And again, with this PHEV vehicle, you can see that the concentrations and the events where there are tailpipe knocks are confined to just a few areas. So there's something going wrong in these areas. Um, it's a plug-in hybrid. So when we arrived at the start of the route, we'd already depleted the battery such that it is in normal but charge sustaining mode. So it's trying to keep the traction battery at a capacity of, I think, 13%. So the engine is um, cutting in and out to maintain the, 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 the battery power. 
but I'm going to take you on a little drive in this plug-in hybrid through Swiss Cottage, which does not contain any, um, which does not contain any speed bumps, but it does contain some rather congested driving and some lane switching. So in the bottom right-hand corner of the video, you can see the power indicator of the vehicle. Um, and what I need you to look out for is when it's in EV mode, that's when the electric motor is either being driven um, as a generator for regenerative braking, but when it goes like, um, when it changes from EV to a hollow car shape like that, that's the engine restarting and restarting under load. On the left-hand side, the trace at the top is the lambda that we're measuring from the OBD port of the vehicle. And on the bottom, in blue, that's the instantaneous grams per second of NOx which are being pu uh, pushed out. So what is happening here is that when the engine's switched off, there's nothing to see. But as we pull away and the engine starts under load, the lambda control of this PFI gasoline engine, um, the lambda control starts rich as you can see there but it's allowed to drift lean and as it drifts lean the three-way catalyst can't convert the NOx, can't come out with the NOx. so because we're going through uh, an intersection which requires a lot of transients so a lot of lane uh, changing and a lot of finding a space into which you can fit your vehicle because this part of london is a right hand turn but we are eventually going to depart from this road junction by taking a left hand uh, exit there's a lot of trying to uh, quickly accelerate to find a gap in the traffic and because the fueling control is allowed to uh, drift lean after a small duration rich start then there are uh, significant quantities of NOx um, being emitted now i suspect that um, this is a euro 6b uh, vehicle I'm guessing that for Euro 6D, these sort of problems have been solved. But it's a nice application showing some very transient, uh, short duration NOx data. And when we sum up the cumulative grams of NOx over the whole 55 kilometers, you can see that Swiss Cottage and those other two parts called Montpellier Park and Neesden, uh, Montpellier Park and Neesden, both are areas where there are speed bumps and Swiss Cottage we've just seen, but over the entire 55 kilometers, 70% of the total NOx was just because of the transients and the um, uh, transient NOx produced uh, invoked by that style of driving. Now, if you ask a calibrator um, that if they're interested in tailpipe NOx, they are, but they always want the moon on a stick, so they also want two channels. They want to see what the engine out is doing. So the instrument has got two channels. So if you're able to get access to the pre and post catalyst, you can see data which, uh, which is shown here, where the red is the instantaneous uh, engine out NO and the blue is the tailpipe NO and so by comparing the two you can get uh, real-time catalyst uh, conversion efficiency and again we're plotting this alongside lambda in green you can see the closed loop lambda control and the lean half cycles causing um, sporadic breakthrough of NOx into the tailpipe uh, this is a fairly rapid uh, acceleration up a hill in Cambridge, and you can see at 1082 seconds, there's one period there where there's virtually no catalyst conversion at all. So um, this is during a rapid acceleration. So um, perhaps this is useful for engine calibrators um, when, um, when driving on the road. So last two or three slides, we've recently launched a couple of new products. Um, we have the latest version of our uh, fast FID uh, now has its own uh, data logging. Um, it's still very fast, can be used in the exhaust port. Uh, it's also much got much better pressure tolerance. So without having to change different sample probes, you can measure upstream of a turbocharger, for example. Um, it's, its performance in terms of linearity and synergism is much more akin to what you might expect from a, a conventional bench analyzer. Uh, and you can add multiple channels to the same uh, base system. And coming later this year, um, there are modules that you can add to the sample head and to the main control unit, which will allow you to measure both hydrocarbons with NO and NO2, all simultaneously through a single sample probe. But perhaps um, 
appropriate for uh, a global pandemic. We've also launched a rather cheaper version of the Fast FID, which is basically the HFR 500 technology sample head housed in a box along with a small vacuum pump. Um, so this allows for uh, measurements post turbo, but still pre and post catalyst if required, but it's one channel. So it's a one channel device. Um, it, uh, its sample head is in the box with a, a three meter heated sample line. So there are some links on there if you fancied looking at uh, the details of those. And coming next week, my colleague, my friend and colleague, John Simons, will be talking about a new catalytic stripper for those who are interested in um, sub 23 nanometer particles. And generally we'll also talk about our DMS 500 fast particle analyzer, which I plugged um, earlier, uh, earlier in the webinar. And so with that, I'll pause and please get in contact with me if you would like a copy of this presentation or if you've got any other questions, I'll sit quietly and wait for anything to come in. So hello again, there are a number of questions coming in, so that's very kind of you. Um, I think we've got some things here about particle number engine out and tailpipe in our mobile system. Well, sorry to be a little disappointing, but we haven't yet mobilized our particle instrument. Um, so although there is an accessory that comes with the lab-based DMS 500, which automatically switches uh, the sample point between two sample lines, one based upstream and one based downstream, it's not yet mobilized. So I'm sorry that we're unable to provide that at the moment. However, if there's enough demand, we'll do anything. Okay, so thank you for that question. Now, there is a, a good question here about the delay time. The delay time from the measurement point of the analyzer, is that taken into account during the measurement or is this done in post-processing? Well, in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the existing equipment and the data I showed you here, there, is, there has been no post-processing required because when you're looking at catalysts uh, or, or engine out versus tailpipe, the delay time through the fast gas analyzers is only it's maybe maximum 20 milliseconds for the slowest analyzer, which is COCO2. And where you, when you're looking at data scrolling past in real time, that 20 milliseconds is basically like a pixel's worth of delay that you see on the screen. So we don't actually, it's easy to interpret without having to make that correction. However, if you're measuring in the exhaust port and you're trying to uh, correlate what's happening from a single exhaust stroke with cylinder pressure, then you do need to make uh, a correction there. And uh, this is not done automatically. It does have to be done uh, in terms of post-processing. However, for the FID 600 um, new product, which I showed you in the second last slide, um, that has its own built-in data processing uh, data logger inside, and you can put in fixed delays in there. So that, that, that would help in that situation. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the question as well about, does the fast feed device allow the use of crank angle encoder to produce crank degree based sample? Um, I think that does for the FID 600 system because of the uh, inbuilt um, data acquisition. But all of the data I've shown you so far though, is from uh, 
older versions of the fast FID, which is just a simple analog out, which you would then stream into your, uh, you know, whatever data data recorder you have. Um, but yes, the FID uh, 600 should be able to do that. Um, another question here, is it possible the integration of this device with traditional PEMS analyzers? Um, well, they have been run back to back, as I showed you with the Marla equipment. Now, I don't know, I don't know what you mean by integration, though, because um, effectively what we've done is we have taken the exhaust mass flow as reported by the uh, diagnostics port, so as reported by the ECU, uh, the OBD port of the vehicle, and combined that with some RDE software, which we use to drive our gas analyzers, to give us instantaneous real-time uh, mass flux of emissions um, but we haven't performed any integration of that of our fast RDE data with PEMS data you can log them side by side and the PEMS data you know will give you your uh, legislatively accurate um, rubber stamp in terms of how many milligrams per kilometer uh, you, you're, you're driving but what it won't do is pinpoint where the spikes occurred and what they correlate with, which caused those emissions to occur. So the RDEs, the fast RDEs equipment, its real advantage comes with the fact that it's it's a calibration tool, really. You would not use it to certify a vehicle because it's not, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's tuned for very fast response. It's not tuned for um, stability and accuracy. But in terms of being able to identify why emissions are occurring, uh, it's it's that's its that's its main that's its main reason. Uh, is the fast FED measurements affected by vibration? Right. So yes, that's a good question. We have looked into that, and with a normally sprung vehicle, we've seen no effect. So what we've done is we have flowed calibration gas into a fast FID. In fact, into all of the analyzers while driving over rough roads and speed bumps, and we have seen a very steady output. So we don't believe there is any um, uh, interference there. However, if you bolt a fast FID sample head directly onto an engine, so hard mount it to an engine, where you get uh, engine firing frequency vibrations, you can see that. So I think that the damping that's provided by the suspension system of modern vehicles is good enough and, 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 and doesn't, doesn't translate into interference on the, on the fast fit signal. Um, somebody had mentioned about um, uh, crank angle input. Um, there is a variable reluctance um, uh, input for, for crank angle uh, for the FID 600. Okay, so I don't know if, uh, if there are any more questions out there, but um, uh, that was very kind of you all to humor me by um, putting up with me for the last uh, 50 minutes. Um, and any other questions, please, you are always welcome to email me. Uh, the Cambushton website is there. And um, uh, my email address is shown on the front page and on the final page of the, 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 the presentation. So just let me know. And if you have a particular application that you would like me to go into more deeply, I've only shown you a, 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 a snapshot of the amount of data uh, that we have. Um, and in future, we will do something uh, which is, um, is being done through DieselNet, but we'll look at specifically diesel applications in a separate webinar uh, yet, to be, um, yet to be devised. But uh, that should be advertised via DieselNet in the in near future. Okay, so thank you. Um, have a good evening, have a good morning, have a good afternoon, and, and good night.